Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host Keith Berkelhammer. So on today's live stream, I welcome Mark Levinson. Hey Mark, what's up man? Thanks for joining us. Hello, thanks for inviting me. So for those of you that don't know Mark, and there's probably not a lot of you out there that don't know Mark, he has been in the hobby since 1997, blogging his experiences about his own reef on his website, melevsreef.com, to help others learn husbandry skills. Mark also has 65,000 subscribers on YouTube, and he too has a regular live stream, but he has been at it much, much longer than I have, and he's got a much bigger following. So I am I'm very psyched to have him on the uh, on the live stream. He also has uh, got a, a ton of followers on Instagram. And Mark is a nationally recognized speaker and is currently the president of the Dallas-Fort Worth Marine Aquarium Society. But before we start talking to you there, Mark, just want to take care of a little uh, housekeeping and thank the sponsors for the show, Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate those companies. Um, supporting the live stream and i also appreciate you folks tuning in and i see there's a whole bunch of uh, familiar faces out there and, and some some new folks as well in the uh, in the chat as per usual please uh drop your comments in the uh, in the chat or ask questions we've got mark here it's a uh, very unique uh, opportunity to to ask away and um boy we got a lot of folks uh commenting in the chat already there mark um so, Mark, man, just uh, for those of us that are not familiar with your reef keeping journey, how did it all begin for you in this great hobby of ours? How did it, how did you be uh, how did you get your start? Uh, it's it's the truth is I got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happened. I got divorced. I left the courthouse with the papers in my hand, and I went straight to the fish store and bought an aquarium and said, "It's time to spend money on me." <laughs> it's a hundred percent true. I mean, I've told it a number of times, and I don't know. It doesn't stick. No one seems to remember it. But yeah, so uh, what ha when I was a kid, my dad had saltwater tanks, and I would uh, help him somewhat, and eventually he let me have my own little 20-gallon long, and I had that for a duration. I don't know how long. I'd assume less than six months, and what ended up happening was the uh, I went to school, and that day that I went to school, everything in the tank had died. Like, I woke up and Bummer. everything was dead, and when I came home from school, the tank was gone. <laughs> My dad just, and that was it. <laughs> so I never found out what happened. I never understood it. It was, it was horrific. Um, it was a tank full of invertebrates. I didn't have any fish in there because I didn't like the rules. The rules were you can have, you know, this much fish in a small aquarium. And I didn't like that. And I said, well, how many invertebrates can I have? And they said, as many as you want. So I just packed it with <laughs> shrimp and crabs and things that crawled. I was mm. super excited about that. And that day that I woke up, the corbin and shrimp pair that I had, the mated pair, one attacked the other and ripped its arms oh. off and and then she died as i'm watching i'm like okay i don't know it must have been something in the tap water we used because we didn't use our water yeah. back then bummer so uh adam moore is asking uh, mark if you're in the witness protection program because it looks like you're in a new location there <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about that <laughs> yes yeah, keep that on the down low um <laughs> Let's talk about YouTube uh, to begin with, man. Let's uh, let's let's talk about your YouTubing uh, journey. I mean, I've uh, I've been following you for a very very long time, <clears throat> and I was I was doing a little digging on your channel the other day, and I noticed that you mm -hmm. started. I guess your, your first video was 15 years ago, but then you had a gap of about four years, and then you started kind of like um, putting out more videos. You uh, and and you definitely found your groove and started getting a lot of. A lot of views what um what do you think was the key for you in terms of getting engagement with a lot of folks out there um well one of the things that i did once i started to actually put out videos was to ask people to go watch and so i would go to my social media i would you know i was in a couple of different groups i think i might have posted posts on dfw mass as well saying here's the latest video and i always encouraged everyone that was watching to please subscribe and that was my method and I've always, and I always did my own. In other words, I see people do this and it bothers me, <laughs> but I can't control others. I can mm. only control me. And I see people will come onto my channel 
and then put a link to their channel saying, come follow mine. And I'm just thinking it's rude. Yeah. I never did that on anyone's video ever. Not one time did I say, oh, let me go into their home and promote my <laughs> my thing, my shtick, you know? So anyway, I always did that, and I'd put the posts out there, and I spread the word. And it was slow growing. I remember when I first was, you know, I had a few hundred people. You know, it was very small. And I joked on Facebook, and my mother got mad at me. <laughs> I joked that um, I needed a few more people to subscribe so we could hit 666. <laughs> And she was like, that's inappropriate. And that's wrong. And I was like, it's hilarious. And I had people arguing. I like, no, I want it. No, I want it. I will join and then exit and come back in to get that one. And they were fighting for the 666 position, which was really fun. And then, you know, of course, it went right past it. And then it was 1,000 and, you know, then 2,000. And you've probably seen this on Instagram. Someone will hit a certain number and they'll do, thank you, yeah. you know, for 5,000 yeah. or whatever. And I remember doing some of that myself, sort of. You know, it's not a huge thing in my brain, but I did like to see the numbers grow. And I mean, honestly, I'd love to see much bigger numbers, but I think I have a very specific audience, uh, an audience that's willing to put up with me for a long time because <laughs> I don't do those quick little nine minute videos. Yeah. And, and you're really, uh, you're doing a lot of live streams too. I mean, why, why, um, why do you think that has been really uh, successful for you in terms of just getting a lot of folks to, um, you know, go on your live streams? I mean, you get a big following on those live streams. Yeah. Uh, the average probably is around 170 to 280 people that are there during the wow. live. And then about 4,000 people watch the video or listen to it. Some, some just listen. And I've had a lot of people over the years, you know, I say a lot, a, a dozen, 20, I don't know, would say, please make it a podcast where I can just download. And sometimes my live streams are visual where I explain things and show things. So it makes no sense to have an audio only. It'd be very awkward to listen to. And here's this, loosen this little thing yeah. right here and adjust that. So anyway, uh, I've never done that. I'm sure there's software out there where someone could literally strip the YouTube, <laughs> grab the sound bites and import yeah, it's it a into lot of whatever. Work. But it is an extra thing, and I just chose not to do that. I, I, and the thing is, is that I think what the audience liked the most, I would talk about a topic for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then I'd open up to the audience, and I'd answer their questions live. And I've been doing that now for, I don't know, three, four yeah. years. And, the, and people that are new to the channel don't know. They don't understand how long they have to wait for me to notice their question. <laughs> and they could ask me a question. It's like 25 minutes later, I finally see it because I cannot multitask. I am tasking because I can't multitask. <laughs> and when I finally see it, I'll answer. And they may, they may be long gone. You know, they may not Are you, be there uh, You're wearing multiple hats when you do the live stream too. I mean, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm like the moderator. I'm the host. I'm the tech guy. You know, it's like all these hats yeah. you got to wear. And it's a juggling act. Well, I have moderators, which really yeah. helps. And I uh, use a certain type of software called Ecamm yep. Live. And that one does some goofy things that, for example, if a moderator sees a bad series of posts and, and deletes them, they still show up in my software. And so then I have to decide, do I ignore this or do I address it? And I, I've been told after the fact by my moderators, oh, we had deleted that, but you brought it up. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, OK, well, I didn't know. I mean, sometimes what they say is so outlandish, it's <clears> funny. <throat> and so I, I point it out. And other times... It's just, I just ignore it and find, look for the next question. Uh, one thing that I'm doing that maybe works for your channel, I mean, maybe you've done it already, I don't know. Uh, I've asked my audience to actually do Add Me Loves Reef when they ask their question, oh, yeah. because my software will filter it to only the questions now, yeah, which is really that's nice. Helpful. And I can just pull them all up and I don't see all the chatter, because sometimes there's a lot of back and forth between members while I'm doing a presentation. And then I'm later on trying to find questions. I'm like, wow, there's a lot about the calcium reactor right here. And I have to keep scrolling. I got a funny story for you. I, um, so I have this live webcam on my 187 gallon tank that runs 24 seven. And, um, yeah. I was, uh, several months ago, I got a whole bunch of spam bots that started like, you know, just bombarding the chat. And I was like, all right, I'm going to just delete this person forever, forever, forever. I was doing that for like a couple of weeks. Like this just kept coming, you know, it's like a, yeah. a losing battle. So I, yeah. um, I got this software that um, was essentially like this anti-bot uh, software that I put on my channel. And then I thought yeah. it was just for the, uh, for the live webcam. So it was, um, you know, anybody that put down like multiple things or whatever keywords, they would just get automatically deleted the comments and stuff like that. So I had it mm -hmm. running when I was doing this live stream and I had, um, I think I might've had like um, Julian Sprung on or something like that. And Jake Adams was in the chat and um, the spam bot, like, put him in a timeout. 
<laughs> I was like, I didn't do that, Jake. I didn't do that. <laughs> but uh, it was like randomly putting people in time timeouts for like no reason at all. And I was like, all right, I gotta, yeah. I gotta get rid of the spam bot software. I'm gonna get rid of uh, the chat feature in my live webcam and just be done with it all. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, fun times. Yeah, some people just want to look at a tank. They don't even want conversation. And I'm finding myself with some of my videos recently when I release an actual edited video, I don't even want to talk the whole time. Yeah. And so I'll tell them, so I have something to say now. And then I'll just suddenly stop and it's just like quiet. And I'm like, okay, now I have something to say again. And I know it's a little awkward and I probably should drop music in there or something. But it's like for me to fill six minutes of conversation sometimes seems redundant yeah. or repetitive because I've talked about in other videos. And so I don't know. I try not to bore people. I, I do yeah. my best. I'll never get it right, but I do the best. Well, I can. we've got a few comments here in the chat. Josh, the box, Mark, you're awesome. A great educator in this hobby. Um, we've got a lot of, um, this, uh, hands up, high fives, <laughs> whatever. And, uh, uh, -huh. uh, what else? Um, well, all right, we got a couple of questions already for you there, Mark. But let me um, <clears throat> let me ask you a question about uh, your 400 gallon mixed reef tank. So it just recently turned eight years old, and you said I saw in yes. your video that it was the longest time you've actually been able to keep a tank running. I've only had a tank. My record is like five years in terms of having mm -hmm. a tank uh, running. So you know, I mean, there's so many different things that could happen to a reef tank in terms of um, you know impacting its uh, its its longevity. It could be user error. It, um, you know, I mean, a ton of different things. And, and I've certainly run into my share of, um, you know, I've done a lot of boneheaded things in my over the, over the years in, in terms of uh, reef tanks. But, um, you know, I guess it can't totally be avoided. Maybe they could be uh, minimized. But what, what's been, uh, you know, what do you think has been one key to success in terms of keeping this tank going for eight years? I mean, I, I guess you've had some resets, but you haven't had a, um, you know, a total tank teardown. Yeah, I've never had, well... I had had to take a tank. I had to tear a tank down that leaked. Um, it was at my 280. That was six years old. It was just like days short of six mm. years old, and it started dripping on Fourth of July, and so I had to drain it that day on the spot and get it completely out of the house. That sucked. But um, and then the oldest tank before that was my 29 gallon that I ran for seven oh. years. But after this one now is now eight years and. Uh, I don't know, a couple of months. It's November 10th was the anniversary. And in that time, I mean, the one thing that I still get to, I don't know if it's called bragging or not, but I get to say I've never crashed a tank in all these years. And even when this thing was kind of falling apart on me uh, a few months ago, I was like, this still isn't a crash. Half the tank's yeah. alive. A crash is a yeah. total wipeout. That's where you are like fishing for fish out of white yeah. soup. And maybe a coral survived. I mean, that's crash. And I had living corals and living anemones, and I had some corals turn white, and I had some corals die. And people started to even say themselves, that wasn't a crash. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So in, in a way, that's kind of nice. And I'm glad that after all these years, whatever it is, 24 years, I guess, 25 this <clears throat> year, um, not had a crash yet. And I think part of it is I'm always doing logistical stuff. I'm always thinking, what can go wrong? And how can I avoid it? And how can I prepare for it in advance? And I've done things, you know, you talk about boneheaded stuff. I, um, when I set up the 400 gallon in 2011, I set it up with two pumps that are identical side by side. And I put all the plumbing together so that if one pump were to fail, I could literally close a valve, open a valve, and the other pump would just take yeah. over. And in the meantime, when it wasn't being needed for an emergency, it would be my manifold pump. So I had one to feed all the equipment. I had one for the return pump. But if the return pump failed, I could change a valve. So I built that in. And then five years later, I had a problem with the return pump. And I was like, oh, I got to deal with this. So I closed the valve, and I'm taking the pump out, and I'm cleaning the pump and building new bearings. I do all this stuff. And the whole time, the tank is down. You know, it's just vortex yeah. running. And then I am putting the pump back into place. And as I look up, I'm like, there's that valve. I could have had that open the whole time <laughs> and kept the flow running, you know, with filtration through yeah. the sump and the skimmer and all that. And I was like, man, I put that in specifically for this exact incident and didn't even use it because I forgot. And it was in front of me. I mean, I, I don't remember a lot of things that I do with my tank and, and, and stuff that I have. I mean, I've got like this bin of like this junk bin of equipment. And, and sometimes I'll be like, all right, I need to uh, order a, a heater. 
wait a minute, do I have something already stashed away in this bin? I mean, or in the shelves yeah. someplace? It's um, it's amazing right. all you know all the years that you're in the hobby, the stuff you kind of collect. And I'm kind of a hoarder in that regard, which I guess is not a bad thing. I think yeah. we all are. I think yeah. we all are. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mark, what um, you know, we were we were talking. Uh, I think before the uh, live stream that you've got a relatively deep sand bed and um mm -hmm. what to, and i and i saw this question pop up um in the chat adam had a question about um vacuuming a sand bed i'll get to his question but let's kind of transition to um into his question from the question i'm going to ask you and, and that is um okay. you know there's a thing called old tank syndrome out there and i think typically that happens to tanks that um you know have sand beds but um maybe i'm wrong about that i don't know if we know that much about um old tank syndrome what um what have you done over the years to kind of maintain that sand bed? Do you uh do you vacuum it on a regular basis? Do you let the cleanup crew do the work? I actually let the cleanup crew do the work and I've ignored it. And my tank, I mean, I've had a problem for <clears throat> oh, ever since I had the vet come out. Uh, I had a fish vet come here to look at Spock, which is my Nassau tang. And she used her API kit and she says your nitrates are sky high, which was weird. And there were times where my nitrates were high, but then the next time I checked, they hmm. were not. I thought, okay, that's weird. It was just kind of like they're 40, and then boom, they're 80. And then three weeks later, they're 80. 40 again, and like they're staying Ooh. around 40. I know. And so then after she came and she said they were 80, she goes, you really need to get these down. You need to do some big water changes. It was hilarious. She's telling me what to do. And I'm, you know, because I mean, I need her to help the yeah. fish. <laughs> But the aquarium husbandry thing, I think I kind of got that one figured out. And I knew water changes would fix it. And I had done some, but they weren't coming down. They stayed 80, 80, 80, 80, all the time 80. I, matter of fact, I had to go buy an API kit because that measures high enough. Oh, wow. Because, uh, you know, ELOS goes to 25. So you're off the um, charts there. Think of that brand new HANA checker. It's like less than 15 or whatever, you know. There's all these different ones. And so I used the API kit and I'm measuring it. And so then I started to use products that we can buy as hobbyists. And I said, okay, I want to try this. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run these bio bricks in my sump and they're going to remove the nitrate. And I did everything I was supposed to do. I was in contact with the manufacturer. I tried for nine months straight, sent them video clips of how I had it running, where it was positioned, what was the flow like, did it turn to sponge or was it still rigid, you know, all the stuff. Nitrates never hmm. budged. And then I switched to Nopox. And I went through bottles and bottles of Nopox. And I had this pink goo everywhere. Inside the vortex, Ooh. inside the strainer basket, the return pump. Spider webbing the refugium, the entire sump was... I just kept netting out this horrible pink slime. It was disgusting. And I was so fed up with it. And I did reach out to Red Sea and said, okay, so I'm do you're using your product. I'm using this uh, amount. What do you recommend? And the only thing that I did not do that they recommended to me was I didn't skim wet enough. I basically just had my skimmer set and mm. I ignored it. And I just cleaned it out from right. time to time. And I realized after they brought it to my attention, I've had like this much skim mate in my waste collector for a month. <laughs> it just wasn't hasn't doing grown, yeah. you know? And so it wasn't yeah. wet enough to get, it. and maybe that would have got rid of the pink slime. Maybe it would have just shoved it out faster through the foam. So anyway, point is, I did no pox for months. That didn't work either, I got rid of it. Tried vodka dosing and I started causing some chaos in my tank and stopped that. And I was like, man, so comes to the tank reset. I told Dwayne, I want to do this reef reset. I want to fly you out here and help me because I can't do it by myself. It's too big a job. He's a good friend of mine and he willingly does it. I pay his flight. He shows nice. up. And I told him my goal is to work on the sand bed. So you see, this whole long story comes right back to what you asked. I didn't <laughs> ignore you. <laughs> um, the sand bed itself had been basically left alone completely for eight years. I barely ever wow. touched it. And the old tank syndrome you mentioned is usually attributed to tanks five years and older. And the only problem I had in my tank was nitrate. Everything else was fine when it came to water parameters and coral growth and all that. But it was early last year that I noticed that while my colonies were big, they were really pale. They were just, they didn't look right. good. And I just kept seeing it and it was irritating me. And I saw other people's pictures of their corals, or I saw their reefs, or I saw corals for sale from vendors that are fantastic. And I was like, why don't any of my corals look anything <laughs> like this? I started getting really mad. I was like, turn off the computer. I don't want to look. And you know, I stopped looking at my phone. And just I was like, okay, I want to do this reset because I really think I need to attack the sand bed. And so I had done a couple of water changes earlier in the year and worked on the sand bed with Caitlin. And then 
when Dwayne was here, we spent three different nights working on the reef. And each night I worked on a section of the sand bed. I didn't want to do the whole thing at yeah. once, but I definitely want to deal with the front and then the end and then the back and kind of get into the horseshoe shapes. And we pulled out so much brown detritus. It was just so disgusting. you were just siphoning out the uh, sand bed in sections. Yes, with a super long yep, gravel vac, yep. you know, just where you have to squeeze the tube so you don't suck yeah. the sand out. And we worked and worked and worked it. And when he left, nitrates, I think, measured 60. And then like three days later, they measured 50. And so I, I knew we'd made good forward momentum. Fast forward a couple more weeks, I did another water change, like 40 gallons on a 450 gallon system. And I worked on the sand bed in the horseshoes again to get any more brown I could. And I got my nitrates down to 30. And I was like, all right, now we're starting to cook with fire. <laughs> now things are yeah. right. And every other parameter is perfect. So really, I'm bringing nitrate where it needs to be that's been wrong for so super yeah. long. And then I saw hints of cyano here and there in the tank. And there was some in the refugium, but it was not like blankets. It was just like between the yeah. sand and the glass, it was pink. And I was like, I want that gone. I don't like it. So I thought, let me treat the tank for cyano because... I want to eliminate that before it becomes a big bloom. It's much easier to treat a small amount of a problem than treat a big problem. And I treated the tank, and the tank just looked fantastic. The corals were gorgeous. I'm taking all these pictures. Skimmer hasn't been on in three days. And I'm like, man, these corals have never looked this good. Nitrates were down around 15. No, they were still 30. And after the cyano treatment, I had to do a big water change, which ended up being a lot yeah. of water because the skimmer kept wasting water, and I just kept throwing it away and replacing it with new salt water. And after that treatment, the nitrates are down to 15. I was like, whoa, wow, we've really got them down. Okay, well, that's kind of where I want to be. I'm happy with 15. And then the next day, they were 10. And I'm like, what's <laughs> happening, you know? And it was because Stop. I also had this, I had this resin I got from Brightwell called Nitrate R. Have you no. seen it? It's like these beads. And uh, I really don't know why they don't call it D, like a capital D, Nitrate R, because that's what it is. It's to remove right. nitrate. And it's some kind of resin you can recharge and use over and over. And I had all this resin in there for 400 gallons, but I just did a 200 gallon water change on Ooh. the tank. So I had like twice as much media to work on half as yeah. much dirty water. Yeah. And it was sucking the nitrate out. And I disconnected immediately and I dosed some nitrate to get it back up to 10 because I didn't want yeah. things to go wrong with my tank. But my tank still started going wrong and I didn't know why. And it was, as I talked about earlier in the phone call with you, that I had a lack of potassium in the system. And that took me 10, 15 days to even determine. At the time, I was like, I don't know what's going on. I guess I took out too much nitrate. Let's uh, let's let's talk about um, potassium in a second. But I want to just dig a little bit deeper in terms of. So you you treated with uh, with chemicals the uh, the cyano. Was that what you did in terms of the treatment? Yeah, I used red cyano. Red, okay. What um what are your yeah. thoughts in terms of um you know any collateral damage you know that sort of stuff can do to the uh, to the bacteria population? Is that something that um you know, is a concern or, or something that, um, you know, folks should be concerned about. Okay. No, no, I've been recommending ChemiClean or Red Sign RX. I think they're the exact same product, uh, two different companies. And I, I've told people for years, when you have cyano, just treat the tank and get rid of it. Solve the problem in two or three days. And of course, everyone's like, don't listen to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you need to feed less. You need to increase your flow. You need to turn off your lights. And I'm like, or you could just do ChemiClean and be done. And they're like, no, no, no. And so everyone's like, I don't want to put chemicals in my water. I want to do it the natural way. I'm like, there's nothing natural in a reef tanks. Or literally, the whole thing is not natural. We put together all these corals that don't live together in, na in nature harmon harmoniously. We have fish together that maybe never see each other in real life because they're from different oceans. We put it all in there, and then we add all kinds of chemicals anyway. The salt mix is a chemical. <laughs> so anyway, I was just like, just use it. And so what ends up happening is people will wait three months, four months, six months, nine months, and they just see cyano the entire time, which I can't imagine living through that, mm -hmm. right? And then they're finally like, you know what? I'm just going to do what Mark said. And then they treat the tank, and three days later, they have white sand. And they're like, oh, my God. Why didn't I listen to Mark nine months ago? I have been hating my tank for so long. And I, you know, I don't say I told you so because I don't. I, I did encourage that, but I understand everyone has to make their own decision for themselves myself, I don't like to treat for it because of my protein skimmer, because my skimmer wants to overflow yeah. nonstop. But if in the past, you know, with smaller tanks, it was easier. I don't know why. The bigger tanks, just it's harder. But on my smaller tanks, if I had to use it once or twice a year to get rid of some, I had no problem with it, and I had no problem recommending to others 
because it works so well and it gets the job done. And if you're hating your tank right now, a week from now, you're going to be loving your tank again. And I just don't see the reason to not I mean, do I've, it. I've done both. I mean, I've used chemicals to uh, combat cyano and then I've also done good old uh, elbow grease. And you know, you're right. It does take a long time when you're just trying to um, be diligent in terms of siphoning it out and doing the water yeah. changes and blowing that tritus off the uh, off the sand bed. Yeah. I just um, I get nervous though to using the chemicals. I, I I try to hold off on doing that unless it's like a big plague proportion of like cyano that's just covering everything. Um, mm -hmm. What do you what do you think in terms of all the uh, you know the bacteria testing that um, you know has kind of been in vogue I guess and you know there's a company out there Aquabiomics that uh, you know you can send in your your water to test it out in terms of comparing the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria. Is that something you've done? Yeah. Uh, and I haven't done it yet. It is on my list of things I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to do it before I did my reset because that was that system. Eight years, you know, <laughs> it was going to be really interesting. But since I've done so much to the tank since then, you know, cleaned out all the sand bed, you know, I, I already dose bacteria anyway because I put in Prodibio every 15 mm -hmm. days. So I'm putting in BioDigest, I'm putting in Bioptem. Those are two different competing bacteria. One's well, one's a food, and I think the other one's the bacteria. And then I, from time to time, I like using Live Rock Enhance. And um, what other bacteria do I put in there? Oh, uh, when I use Benarif, Benarif has bacteria in it too that comes to life as once you mix it with water and then you let it sit and then you pour it in the tank. And we we put those in. And if you treated your tank with <clears throat> uh, ChemiClean and you felt like you just killed a lot of great bacteria, you know, you had the, the best bacteria and you killed some of it. You could definitely put more in. Right. You could add right. whatever, Dr. Tim's or whoever. Yeah, and I, I never, I never, I never like did this. dose when I was treating with ChemiClean. I've just started actually dosing bacteria, just just uh, on a regular basis for for other reasons. And um, you yeah. know, I've seen good results. I can't tell you that it's because of the bacteria dosing that the tank seems to be looking really, really good. Right. But um, I think one side benefit for me is that um, I've been using uh, Kato, you know, for a while on, on both of my systems. And now I don't need the Kato anymore, which is kind of a nice thing because it saves me a lot of work, right? Because Kato can be yeah. sort of a pain in the ass to, at times to uh, to keep alive and and to clean yeah. and and to maintain. So I I think the um, dosing the bacteria I've been dosing the uh, Brightwell's Microbacter uh, Seven as well as the uh, okay. as well as yeah. the clean. So yeah, I I think that uh, you know at, at this point in time the tank's looking really good, and also my nitrates and phosphates yeah. are um, you know in check and. Not a lot of mm -hmm. uh, problematic algae. Yeah, I was wondering which bacteria you use. I also have used Microbacter 7 in the time, in the past when I needed to. Uh, pods from Reef Nutrition. I have another bottle of pods from Fauna Marin they gave me that I've been, it was just a sample bottle and I've just been squirting yeah. it in from time to time. But uh, Calcium Reactor does everything. Refugium grows. Algae Turf Scrubber grows. Um, skimmer skims. And... Uh, Predibio. I mean, that's that's my routine. There's no and like I just did a little water change two days ago and did a video about it. And um, I'll do one more because I'm trying to use up some salt water that was too salty. Mm. So I had to like move it into yeah. a separate container to dilute it. And I need to get that blue barrel out of my kitchen now. So I've got a second barrel. I just finished adding RO water to today. I got to check salinity and make sure everything's right and make sure alkalinity is right. And if they're good, I'll do another quick. 54 gallon water change and then i'll get the barrel out of the right. house yeah. get, <laughs> get, get a little room um well yeah it's in, oh yeah it's in a corner right now but there's some things that are about to happen in my life that are going to affect the reef and so i've got to make sure i get these things out of the way yeah no it's um it, it's interesting how how quickly you could kind of run out of room and you got to move things around and and um yeah it's it's always a challenge i find to um but yeah. you know Sometimes it's a fun challenge. Try to like reconfigure yeah. stuff. So, so let's go back to your old tank syndrome for a second, because you know it's been thrown around. A lot of people like to use that as you know oh, that's that's why you have right. a problem. Old tank syndrome, nothing you do about it. Tear it down, start over. That's not really a, a solution, in my opinion. I never feel that tearing down a tank is the right choice, and I know you're about to tear down yours, at least yeah. in part. But I never feel that that's necessary as a uh, like to the to the bottom, like completely evaporate the thing. I'm more about making small changes here and there, rearranging, taking out the dead stuff that's in the way, you know, lowering the reef back yeah. down because all the underneath is just tall skeleton now. And like I said, tackle the sand bed. And now my tank, like it's over eight years old, doesn't have old tank syndrome. It's got a lot of pretty corals in it right now and everything's doing really, really well. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's something that I've struggled with a long time in terms of whether or not I should just do this major reset on my tank. It, um, you know, it, it is wall to wall corals right now. And the problem that I have in terms of the rock that's in there is about 95% of that rock that's facing, you know, upwards is either encrusted mm -hmm. with uh, zoanthids or um, mm -hmm. acropora, you know, montipora, what have you. And it's, it's yeah. you know, so if I, if I want to like save that rock, then I'm going to have yeah. to take it out and chisel the crap out of it, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, it's, it's just something. And I wanted a more of a, uh, an open aquascape anyway with this tank. And, you know, so yeah. it, it'll be a nice challenge. I think it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting. And so, um, I feel like you have two more years worth of room in that. You think so? The way it is right now. <laughs> oh yeah. There's like two big colonies, but there's like all that space. Like that could go for another couple of years where it's full. <laughs> But I do know what you're talking about, about the rock. And so there are other choices. Obviously, you could drill a hole right through something yeah, and plant a coral in the middle of whatever's there. And, of course, the encrusting will come right. up. But if that thing is a quick grower, it'll grow up and away from it. So it won't even matter what's happening on the foundation. Yeah, you know, I, it, I know what you mean. I've got like 10 or 11 colonies that are just kind of like dominating that tank right now. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, I guess, you know, when do you know when the right time to reset? You know, when when is the right time yeah. to reset before things start going downhill? I mean, I could already start seeing some recession on some yeah. colonies in that tank. But, you know, mm -hmm. flow is getting restricted and, you know, there's a little warfare going on in, yeah. in that tank. So it's um right. It's tough. It, it's kind of a tough call. But I can tell you that Dwayne and his tank, he's, you know, he likes to reset his like every two years, which is crazy. <laughs> and because he has this beautiful SPS reef. I don't know if you've seen yeah, it. Yeah. He goes by Trito, Trito's yeah. reef. And it's fantastic. And then I've kind of weaned him off of that a little that bit. Method. Because yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? Leave it alone. It's so pretty. <laughs> so he, um, he's now what he's doing is he'll take out one big something and he'll trim it and put some things there and leave the rest alone. And then he'll have something happening here and he'll like create a pocket and work in there or he'll take out two big ones so he can have like five or six little smaller ones. So instead of just ransacking the whole reef, he's only doing little sections now. Yeah. You know, when I do it, I'm going to just do it very, very slowly. It's going to be yeah. um, it's not going to be kind of like um, one day I'm going to go rip out the whole thing and then just uh, swap right. it in. It's just it's going to be a long, long process because I don't want to screw things up. And you sell coral, so I mean, this is perfect for you. I You're have a lot like, of coral. One thousand dollars, WYSIWYG, come buy it. <laughs> yeah, too bad I live uh, kind of like in the sticks because it would be a lot easier for folks to come and pick that stuff up versus shipping it. Which, uh... you know what? Okay, I don't know which stick you're in, but I mean, there's probably roads that lead there, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you told your audience on, I don't know, February nineteenth, whatever day that is. I am going to be working on my tank and you are welcome to come and spend the day because when I reset my reef four years ago, I called the club and I said, Hey guys, I'm doing this thing. Everyone's invited the entire club, which is 600, 800 wow. members. I'm like, you're all wow. welcome. Of course I knew that wouldn't happen, but you know, 20 people came that day and I put one person in charge of the barbecue. Nice. And I put one person in charge of the kitchen. And I said, all, and I put all the food out and all the drinks. I, I provided everything. It was just a mealless reef party. And I just said, you can stay here and you can watch us work. We're going to be doing it all day long. You can stick around a few hours. You can stick around the whole day. As we're working the tank, things are going to break off. I'm going to hand you corals and you're going to go home with these corals. <laughs> and I didn't sell them. I just gave yeah. them away. And a lot of people were accusing me on, on YouTube originally like, oh, okay. So you just, you know, and I'm like, no, and literally gave it away. I was just having a party. A lot of people were here, and I had lots of people with cell phones and cameras, so I had a lot of footage from different angles That's and different awesome. perspectives. It was a cool video. And uh, we did a lot of work that day, and the tank looked a lot better when we were done. And 20 people went home with a lot of coral. Mark, that's a capital idea. I might just have to uh, call out to all the uh, all my uh, subscribers and say, hey, make the trek to Vermont and get some free coral. There you go. Oh, that's the yeah. sticks. Okay. Well, that's a pretty place, It is too. a pretty place. So they get the scenic... Tell them to bring coolers because you want to keep everything nice and warm mm -hmm. on the way home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and like I said, if you have food and drink or even if it's just Toll House cookies and <laughs> Coca-Cola, <laughs> whatever, you know, just have something there for them to snack on. And and they can grab a towel if you need help with something. Like, hey, can you bring me that bucket? I mean, they don't have to be working, but yeah, they can hang no, out. I'm sure that I'll, I'll probably get a lot of takers for that. It'd be fun. Yeah, um, sure. All right. I'm trying to keep track of the, uh, the chat here, uh, Mark. We've got a lot of things flying by, but... Um, Oh yeah, somebody commented uh, Reef Girl. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Uh, 
everybody out there, if you if you're digging what you're seeing here, hit that like button so more people can find us. We got a good we got a good uh, audience uh, tuning in right now. But yeah, the more likes, the more people will uh, will find the uh, find the stream. So we had one question, Mark, about uh, somebody wanted you to talk about bio pellets. So you're talking about um, you know your nitrates and what have you. What um, mm -hmm. what what's been your experience with uh, bio pellets? I used them for several years. They definitely worked. Um, it's funny because that's one of those things you ignore. You set it up, and then if everything is set up correctly, you don't have to look at it again. And I remember one day, I think my nitrates went up a little bit. I was like, oh, that's weird. And I looked down at the reactor, and the reactor is like 30 inches mm -hmm. tall. And it's it's a blue reactor from Next Reef. And in the bottom, I see like seven beads ricocheting. All of it was gone. It was Oops. completely gone. I was like, wow, how did I miss that one? I just did not even look to refill it. Um, the rule of bio pellets is if you're going to run them, the reactor must never turn off. That's very, very important. If you have a power outage or if you're one of those people that turns off your manifold pump or you turn off whatever that feeds that reactor, the oxygen level drops in there really fast and the bio pellets die. And they literally turn from pretty little uh, beige orbs to like gray, dead rotten smelling sulfuric <laughs> hideousness and if you have a power outage and you let your bio pellets die in the reactor and then the power comes back on water's going to push through that and push all that into your system and your tank was fine and now suddenly you're like why is my tank having my issues because your bio pellet reactor just put a bunch of toxic mm. soup into your tank mm. so i tell people if you're gonna have a power outage that's extended you know 10 hours 12 hours 14 hours you know something big and if you are not keeping the return pump going the whole time I tell them to take off any reactors and drain them completely, empty all overflow boxes of any water sitting stagnant in those, because odds are you kept the water moving in the right. reef. You probably had a power head or you had an air stone or whatever. The water in your sump, you might have moved it around with pots and pans, you know, scooping and dumping or whatever. But the overflow boxes, we always forget about them. And then you turn on the flow after these hours or days have gone by. And all that five gallons in each overflow box just drains into your system. And you're like, why is the fish acting weird? Or why are these corals closed up? And it's because of that. So if you are going to run bio pellets, I would recommend you plug the one pump that the bio pellet reactor has into a UPS. Mm. So it always has right. power. Even 45 minutes is a long time for a bio pellet reactor to be without power. Uh, we had a comment. Uh, some Sharon uh, Romano thinks that dosing no pox might be uh, easier. Do you, do you think that's true? Or do you um, are you in... You hate I hate it. Box. I'll never do it yeah. again. I'll never use it again. <laughs> the pink slime was so aggravating. I just felt like I was weekly doing this cleanup. And here's the thing. I was using 54 milliliters a day. Hmm. No, I was using 45 milliliters a day for my whole system, which was the correct amount. But the math on the bottle said I needed 54 a day. So I was actually using a little bit less hmm. than they recommended. And people are like, well, if you're using pink slime, you're using too much. And I'm like, I know I'm not. And then I wrote Red Sea and told them what I was doing. They talked to me like I was a complete newbie. I mean, I, I don't know if they followed a script or whatever, but like, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. And you need to follow this dose. Like, I'm, and it's like you didn't read my paragraph because I literally said I'm using this much, even though the bottle says I need this much. So I know I'm not overdosing. Yeah. And they were like, be careful you don't overdose. You should be using this a number. And I'm like, you're not listening. <laughs> now it's all right. I mean, you know, I, I don't know who I'm talking to. They don't know who I am. I, if they don't know my name, they don't know my name. And that person might have never heard of me. They might live in Germany or, yeah. or, or Denmark or yeah. who knows wherever Red C or Israel, right, is where Red Sea yep. is from. So they might not know me over there or that person may not know me and they might not know my history. And I try to be very uh, expressive in what I'm doing in an email when I try to explain what's going on so that they have the whole picture so they can hopefully help me soar through it. But anyway, it was too messy. It was expensive. I had repeatedly... People sent me the recipe of what you need to make your own. Take three parts this, two parts that, add a teaspoon of this. And I was like, I just, I'm sick of the slime. Yeah. I don't want to deal with it ever again. And my tank sitter swore by the hmm. stuff. He says, I love it. And then he got the pink slime. And then he thought they changed the recipe in hmm. the bottle. And I was like, oh, I don't know. So, but anyway, I, it didn't make my nitrates come down, but my phosphates collapsed. Ooh. And the way I understood no pox, and someone told me on my YouTube in a ginormous reply, they said, I don't know where you heard that. That's not true. But I thought no pox knocks down your nitrate first, and then it knocks down your phosphate. That's how I thought it was. And my nitrates didn't budge, but my phosphates were bottoming out. And so I finally just stopped using it because I needed phosphate. Yeah. And I didn't know why it skipped. And they're like, that's not how that works. And I don't know who told you that. I'm thinking, well, I mean, do you know? 
Do you know which, does it work on both? Does it work on one than the other? I don't know. Do you have any idea? I, I've never used this stuff. Um, okay. But, um, so getting back to using a, a bio pellet reactor, is, is that something when you were using one that you used solely, you didn't have any other kind of, um, you know, form of nutrient export besides a skimmer? I mean, were you, did you have a, uh, nope. that was it? Yeah. That was it. And I, I do water changes rarely. You know, where some people like to do them all the time. I would probably do four or five a year. And uh, I've done one this year. <laughs> really? Only one water change this year? Good. Wow. I do like <laughs> religiously 10% water changes every week. That's, that's every my... Every week. That's 40% per yeah, month. Yeah, I know. I've, I've been doing that for a long time. And um, mm -hmm. I use um, Instant Ocean. So it's, it's not breaking the bank in terms of salt for me. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I find it, uh, it does pretty well. Um, let's get back to talking about, uh, we, we kind of teased the potassium thing a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. you want to talk about your, uh, potassium incident and then we can kind of get into the, yeah. uh, more of a discussion about it. Yeah. So just to be upfront, I never have thought about potassium in my life. <laughs> Me too. And I've been in this hobby since 1997. I've heard it mentioned a couple of times by, you know, like a tank of the month person would mention it or someone cooking up really crazy colors. They'd talk about witch hazel and potassium and, and this i'm like okay i'm not doing that and i was sitting in a talk by terrence years ago before covid and he said potassium is really important you should be at 400 and i looked on my blog because i like to blog about this stuff on my website and i was able to open up my phone and i had my latest icp test it was like three months before and it showed my numbers like 365 i'm like ah, it's pretty close to 400 so all right that's nice to know but it's not something i've ever added to my tank and I, you know, would just assume it's in the salt mix. So my, uh, what happened was when I did the big water change after treating for cyano, I ended up changing more water than I planned. I planned to change 150 gallons. That's what I pulled out. But the skimmer wasted 50 more. Yeah. So I ended up wasting or changing 200 gallons over a period of, uh, four or five hours. And, uh, the next day the tank looked really poor and I was attributing it to just did a reset, messed with the sand bed, lower the nitrate. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea what's going on with this tank, but it makes no sense. And people were telling me that day and, of course, a few days later, because I was doing the Reef Diary series at that time where I did a video every yeah. single day. More and power to you, man. I that's, mentioned, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> Daily you know, video. I, I didn't know how it was going to work <laughs> out. And, uh, it was very, very popular. People liked it. But... I was still trying to figure out what was going on, and I also didn't want to overreact. And I didn't want to tackle the tank, and I didn't know what was happening. And finally, it was probably a week into something was wrong with the reef where things were really wrong that I sent in my ICP sam sample. And then I had to wait a week for the answer. Maybe yeah. it was five days, and I had to wait. But whatever it was, it was probably 14 to 18 days from the water change to getting my first yeah. answer with the ICP result, and it said my potassium was really low, my iodine was a little bit low, uh, magnesium was a little bit low. I mean, it's just these, a couple of things, but the potassium was very low. And I was about to do a live stream with Rich Ross on reef beef, and I sent the ICP to him, and I sent it to Ben Johnson, and I said to them, okay, well, I just got these results literally a minute ago. Now that you're seeing these numbers, how would you fix the tank based on this information? And they both almost unanimously said at the same time, send in another sample, don't do anything. And I'm like, no, I need to solve this. I'm living with a tank that is deteriorating every right before, single day. Right another your eyes. Loss. Yeah. And so I called the ICP company in Denver and said to them, I want to send you a sample overnight and I want to answer that night. Can you do this? And they wrote me back with an email and said, absolutely, no problem. And so the next day I boxed up several samples. I took the reef. I took the frag tank, I took my salt water I've been using, and I made a brand new batch of brand new salt water with a brand new barrel of salt I just got that day. So I sent in four samples. And I'd already, with the first sample I did, the first test I did, I also sent my RO water, just in case something's coming yeah. from the city, from summer, from treating the city yeah. water, you know? And the RO DI water was perfect, the tank was bad, then I sent in four kits, and the next day I got all four kits back, the reef was bad, the frag tank mm. was bad, the salt water is bad, but the new salt water is perfect. Mm. And I was like, well, now these are agreeing with this one. So I literally have four kits that agree with each other. There's a huge lack of potassium. By uh, numbers-wise, it was less than 200. Whoa, that is low. 
And potassium is supposed to be 400 in our tanks. And when you look on the side of the barrel of Aquavitro, I think it says 420 is what they uh, promise is in the barrel. So I sent all my ICP tests to uh, CCAM, and I said, I am happy to send you a sample of the salt. I, this is what I believe is going on. I think there's a massive deficit of potassium mm -hmm. in this mix. I don't know why. I've been using the salt for years, um, but I think because I did such a big water change, it had a massive impact. Versus if I did small ones, I might have still been losing potassium and had some coral die-offs that were like a random thing going RTN and not know why. But instead, I had this massive bad situation going on with the tank, and it was awful. And I also started dosing potassium. Now that I knew, I grabbed a bottle of uh, Elemental, which is Fauna yep. and it has 1,000 milliliters or a liter, and I just set up a dosing pump to dump in 500 milligrams or 500 mLs, mLs yeah. yeah, milligrams today and 500 tomorrow. And that got me from 200 to 300. And then I needed another bottle, and I had to wait a couple days for it to show up. <laughs> And I put that one on, and this time I did 200 mLs per day for five days. And that got me to like 360. And then I got another couple of bottles and hooked them up, and I did them 100 milliliters a day because what I noticed by dosing all that potassium, I started getting this red turf algae on mm. all my rock. You know, it kind of looked like yeah. cyano everywhere, yeah. but it wasn't, it wasn't it was cyano. Turf algae. And it doesn't get longer because my fish keep nibbling on it, so I guess it's edible. But it's, I think it is a red turf of some kind. And my rock definitely grew that from all the potassium dosing. I also got on the phone with uh, Just Incredible, who has done blogs on potassium. And I told him what was going on. And he said, you absolutely need 400 bare minimum. If you're a brand newbie, I'd tell you 400. And he said, you know, I actually want much higher. I've had tanks at 800 and at 1,200. I'm really? like, oh, my God. I mean, he's a mad scientist, okay? <laughs> he's, he does crazy stuff. But uh, then I talked to Joe Waiulo. 20,000 gallon reef yeah. on Long Island. And I said, what do you keep for potassium? And I says, 450. Hmm. I was like, all right. So I've got one guy saying 400. I had Terrence say 400. Uh, I had Joe say 450. So I said, I'm going to stay right in between 400 and 450 from now on. And so I have one more bottle under my tank, hooked up to a dosing pump. But currently my numbers are like 435, so I haven't turned it on. It's just waiting until it starts to drop and I'll trickle it in again. Dude, I mean, I, um, I had, you know, I've been in the hobby for a very long time myself, and I had never ever thought about dosing potassium or really cared that much right. about, you know, I, I, I do ICP tests every now and then. And, um, just kind of yeah. like looking back on some of my recent ICP tests, you know, my potassium is like in the 350 to 360 range for both of my mm -hmm. systems, which now, um, you know, you mentioned it to me. I also had, mm -hmm. uh, do you know, Ty Ta, Farmer Ty, um, in Texas? Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. He mentioned it to me that he, doses potassium and, and it's very uh, diligent about keeping his potassium like 400 plus so i'm like yeah oh geez i guess i better invest in a little uh, test kit and, and start uh staying on top of this stuff yeah but what get the salifer kit because everyone tells me get that i don't even have it. i, got I have Salifer, one yeah. by fauna marin and it works it's it's not the easiest kit in the world you have to do the stuff and then you gotta wait five minutes and then you add some more and you wait two minutes and then you have to add three drops at a time until it starts to turn pink, and then you go to one drop at a yeah. time. But I use a, the Smart Stir, which is that uh, magnetic stirrer. I love it. And I set up the entire thing in that machine and just let it spin the whole time. And I'm just like, drip, drip, drip. And I get my numbers. What? And I like it, but I have not tried the Salaford, but everyone tells me Salaford's even easier yeah, to I use. Yeah, I've got a Salaford kit coming. So um, okay. what, what um, kind of uh, effects did you see? You know, what, what, what did you uh, notice in the corals once you started getting that potassium up? Did uh, you start seeing a big change? Oh, yeah, I had chalices I've had for a super long time that turned completely white end to end. And I mean, they were alive, but they were bone white. There was like no hint of color at all. And I had another chalice I really liked a lot that's very interesting looking, and it had turned brown. And when I got the potassium in the tank, the colors started coming back. And the I, those chalices are on my reef now. I mean, they're completely healed, and they're beautiful. They're green with orange spots. The other one's uh, green and blue and, and orange and yellow. Um, the anemone looked a little pale and it got darker. I'm trying to think what else, what other changes because it's been months since we did all this. But the interesting thing is after my big problem with my tank, you know, when everything went to crap, then for the next <clears throat> three to four weeks, all I did was dose potassium and the entire tank healed. Mm. I mean, I didn't do anything wow. else. I didn't do any water changes. As a matter of fact, Dwayne says, 
you should change more water. I'm like, absolutely not. I'm not putting one more drop of water in this tank. <laughs> I just want to isolate the problem and put in what's missing. And one of the things that was interesting with the ICP test that I didn't expect, it just caught my eye and I was like, oh, that's cool. Remember I told you I had to ship overnight. Yeah. And so I boxed up, you know, brand new water samples that are a week since the last one I sent in, right? Or 10 days. And what I noticed was there was a little tiny rise in iodine. No, or iodide. I don't know. It was just, yeah. it went up a little bit. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Why would that go up? And I was like, I dose IOD plus from Prodibio every 15 days and I dosed it two days ago. So I literally saw the ICP go up a little bit because I put something in my tank a day ago or two days ago. I was like, oh, that was cool because I, I got to see the change. I wasn't even thinking about it. It was just one of those things that was going through that's, the test. That's cool. So we got we got a few comments in here. Uh, Chris from ACA Aquaculture says that he keeps his potassium in the 450 to 500 range. Um, Bert mm -hmm. Minshew is uh, saying, will a banana work to uh, raise uh, <laughs> a, lot a, lot of, a lot of bananas? Um, <laughs> You're going to have to do this to them, squeeze them. <laughs> <laughs> um we've got uh sharon is saying oh my god i never dosed potassium i thought as long as you did regular water changes the salt has it right but i guess if the salt uh is deficient in the potassium then that's yeah. that's uh that was the issue that you ran into yeah so let me talk about that for just a second um when people told me to do icp i kept thinking why should i do an icp test i assumed it was something else happening in the tank like a bad magnet or uh, stray electricity or something some toxin getting into the water because the salt I've been using for years has never had a problem. And on the side is a label that tells you everything that's in that barrel. And I was like, there's no way my salt's the problem. I mean, I absolutely not 100% believe my salt was trustworthy. So when my ICP came back with weird numbers, I thought, well, that's really odd. There's no way that's possible. And that's why when Rich and Ben both told me to send another test, I thought, well, that's crazy. I mean, and they were kind of leaning on, on the impression that, Maybe ICP is not correct. Maybe it's mm. bad. I was like, oh. <laughs> so I paid for more kits and I paid for overnight shipping. And uh, I did all that. And it turns out, and that's what I did. I told Seachem, you know, listen, prove me right. wrong. This is what I believe. And they ended up saying, you know, ship them salt, which I did. I sent them a couple of pounds. They also had a sample of my batch of salt. They pull out of a bin or a drawer or whatever. And they measured it and said, well, it measures good. And they measured mine. They said, your measure is bad. And then they said, after like a week, they said, you know what? Do you have any more of that salt left? I said, yeah, about 40, 45 pounds. They said, can you send all of it to us? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So I sent them a 50-pound box of salt. And, you know, they paid for shipping, which yeah. is good. It was really heavy. I even got to FedEx, like, this is really heavy. <laughs> and uh, they received it. They tested it in-house. They also sent it off to an ICP as well. And they said, yeah, it was low in a bunch of things. Hmm. And the one thing we agreed on was that it wasn't a problem of settling in the barrel. Because a lot of people say, well, you got to mix your salt. But if you think about salt and how it's packaged, it's in a bag, in another bag, in yep. a barrel. At least what I'm buying. And if you were to roll that barrel down the street and back up the street, if you had the, the, the <laughs> muscles to do it, it would be like rolling a bag of flour. Yeah. And you think about flour, there's <clears throat> no movement. There's, I mean, it's, it's a brick yeah. of flour. It can't mix and yep. tumble. Closing your dryer dry because there's all that space and they fluff. And you would literally have to like scoop the salt and pour it in another barrel like this to mix. And then you're going to get the, the stuff in your eyes and your nose. You'll inhale mm, it, which is very good. unhealthy. And so I can't do a bucket transfer. I'm not going to do it with 300 to 500 pounds of salt. And I'm using 80 pounds of salt at a time. That's a lot. Of, that's a quarter of the barrel. So if I use this much salt out of the barrel and then this much salt, even if there was sedimentation, it would have been like the top inch, or right. there'd be like this one strata. But with me using so much salt per session, I shouldn't have found a bad spot. So literally, there was something really wrong with my magic barrel. The way I pictured it in my brain, you know, you saw I Love Lucy where she had to do the yeah, chocolates, yeah, yeah. and yeah. she's shoving them in the yeah. and she's yeah. eating them, and the Classic. conveyor goes faster and faster. So I picture there's this conveyor belt, and they drop calcium chloride, and they drop magnesium chloride, they drop salt sodium i guess and then there's the potassium bin and the bin was empty and the guy said oh i'll do that but i it's time for my lunch and the conveyor <laughs> belt just kept going and i got the one without the shot of potassium is my opinion of how this happened but i don't know how salt is made exactly so you, you think it was just one bad barrel not a yeah they didn't have any other bad barrels from uh. that lot number and they said it got shipped internationally to like africa or somewhere 
and they didn't hear anything. I was like, yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter. But it was, and the salt was not old either. I bought it like in April of this year, and this happened in June. So it was very. I mean, I guess you never know with salt. I mean, you know, I've, I've had, um, I think I had a bad, few bad boxes of instant ocean in terms of magnesium was extremely mm-hmm. low. And I mean, I was like, you know, when yeah. I always test magnesium when I mix a salt, yeah. now I'm going to be test, testing potassium when I mix that salt because, you know, I'm talking to you about it and, and others are, yeah. are uh, it sounds like it's a, re- it's a really good idea to do that. But uh, yeah, so I was like pouring yeah. tons of uh, magnesium to get that up. But um, yeah. I guess you just never know if... Uh, it can happen with every right. brand. I know Fritz had a problem for a little while and people were screaming about alkalinity. Kent years ago, if you remember that nationwide problem where none of the Kent salt had any alkalinity in it, came back one DKH. Ooh, and I had six barrels of that, or buckets of that in my garage at the time. They sent me six new Ooh. buckets. Um, but you never know. And so when I open a brand new anything, box, bag, barrel, I do all the tests. I measure alkaline, calcium, magnesium, salinity, and temperature. And um, mm. yeah, that's what I check. And I don't check strontium. I don't check potassium. I don't check iodine. I don't, you know, those are, I just don't. I figured those are in the mix. And after this happened, I'm like, dang it. Now I got to start measuring <laughs> potassium. And then, you know, one day I'll get bit by a lack of strontium. Like, dang it. Now I got to start doing strontium. So one, a couple of people suggested that maybe in the future, when you open your big barrel that makes a thousand gallons of salt water, you send off a test for ICP. I was just going to say that. Which seems kind of was, unfortunate to spend I know, I was just about to say that. To verify what they should be giving us that should be right. Somebody, If somebody can like um, invent a really cheap ICP uh, test, then that would be awesome. But I guess uh, that's not, um, not going to be possible given the technology um, and where it's at. Well, you said Chris is in the chat. He has his own ICP machine at this point. We should give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is in the chat right now. Um Peter T. Uh, had a good question for you when you were talking about water changes. Are you a- actually adding traces? When you know, given that you're um, not doing water changes, are you adding trace elements to your uh, tank? I am adding via Prodibio, but I'm not like pouring in other bottles of right. things, like not like Kent trace elements or this or that. I've never really. That's one of those things that we were raised. Don't add anything to your tank you can't measure for. Mm. But now we're adding right now we're adding like things in bottles that we have no idea what's in those bottles. We have no idea. I know. And like you talked about earlier about the bacteria biome test, yeah. and then you get this result and it shows you streptococcus or whatever's in there. And you're like, okay, there's a lot of that, but they don't tell you how to put in the one that's missing or they don't say, well, Dr. Tim's are these seven right. and Microbacter seven are these right. two. And, and they could literally say, you know, now that we know what these things are and if they know what's in the bottles, they could tell us you should add this one and that one. And this much of this and this, you know, I mean, they should be able to give us more information. Maybe in a few more years, we'll have a little more science behind it to where we have the information to know what to add to uh, equalize and have lots of different bacteria and not have one monoculture in our tank. Dude, a lot of things have changed since I got into the hobby. I'll tell you, man, it's like it, it's just it's gotten a lot more complicated. It really has, you know, yeah. and I think, yeah. um, you know, that could also be a, um, a, a downfall in terms of if you if you're so numbers oriented and you're just so honed into like um, chasing certain numbers, which I try yeah. not to do. And you're so honed into like, wow, this person is doing that. Maybe I should be considering yeah. this. Whereas like years ago, it was just kind of like you had a, uh, you know, what a calcium reactor or whatever, you know, protein skimmer, you had uh, mechanical filtration, cough or whatever. You had some yeah. and filter, filter socks, socks and, and you grew a lot of <laughs> corals quickly. But yeah, it's uh, it's different these days. And we also use white light. Yes. <laughs> You're not a fan of the blue light, I take it? You know what? I'm kind of, I am kind of loving it, to be honest. It took a long time for me to switch over to it. I uh, used to have, uh, for you know, a decade, I used the Twin Arcs from ReefBrite. And the first half of the bulb is 10K lighting, and then the other half of the bulb is 20K. And I would have it on for you know, several hours in white, and then they would cycle off and cycle on a minute later, and they'd be blue for the rest of the day. And I ended up making the blue longer through the day, so I only had like an hour and a half of white. Right now, I'm running, I, for the last seven months, I've been running the Sky lights from Neptune yeah, Systems, you, which is amazing. Like Love them love them and i have kind of a different spectrum throughout the day every single one of my settings is custom 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 there's not one number that's like 10k <laughs> you know it's like it's literally it says custom it's like i mixed up this weird combination 
So I kind of go through a phase and by nighttime, you know, nine o'clock at night, it's really blue. And by 1030, it's like insane Papa Smurf blue and everything's <laughs> glowing. And then I put in the aqua shell glasses <laughs> like, oh, so pretty. <laughs> but it's so fake. I mean, I just love it because it's so yeah. insane. But during the daytime, my reef looks very normal. And I'll tell you this about the skies that I had someone here and he hadn't seen them yet. And I just used the app on my phone. <laughs> and I just switched them to 100% all four channels. And he was like, wow, that's 100% everything? I was like, yeah. And he's like, it looks like the sun is shining in your tank. It was literally like the right mixture. It just looked yeah. normal. It didn't look blue. Yeah. It didn't look white. It was just kind of probably 12K, 13K. And uh, he was really impressed with that. And he was like, I can't believe you just flip a switch. I was like, yeah, I have five different settings. And I showed him the one I use for when I do my live uh -huh. streams because I'm streaming. And the whole tank is yellow. Right. But it looks right on right. camera. So I'm looking at like a oh, tank is hideous, guys, but behind me it looks okay. You know, to them. But if you were here in person, you're like, can you please turn that off? It's ugly. I'm like, yeah, I know. Yeah, you know, I um, I put I started using LEDs for the first time ever when I um, started my uh, my Peninsula tank, and I've I've been running mm -hmm. metal halides for years and years. I love the 400 watt 20k radium bulbs. Just like got this yeah. crisp white light. And so when I started like tinkering with the LEDs, you know, at the beginning to try to like mm -hmm. find that uh, nice little butter zone. In terms of the right yeah. combination, I, you know, all all these like um, uh, light programs or whatever you call them that were sent to me and recommended, they were like so freaking blue. I was like, and I was yeah. like, I, I I'd be looking at my radium tank, and then I look at the uh, the LED lit tank all blue. I was like, I can't get used to that. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. crazy. Yeah, I'm fine with it late at night. I feel like it's per perfect, the perfect color for as you're getting ready for go to bed. But uh, during the daytime, I don't want to look that crazy blue. Matter of fact, you don't spot as many issues in your tank when it's blue. It hides half the mm. stuff, and you you know you might even know that's cyano because <laughs> it's <laughs> it it looks black under right. blue lighting. It doesn't right. look red, and you may not notice it or how bad it is everywhere. But you put your tank in white light, you're like, oh, I see all the flaws, and it's another reason to make it all blue so you don't see it. Huh. It hides a lot of sins, but I still would recommend having your tank. And my I use uh, the radion um, the uh, yeah the radions over my anemone cube and i use a they call it the radiant bell curve okay. and so it kind of goes through these spectrums of sunlight and then goes back to the blue at night and it ramps up and it ramps down i've been doing that for eight years and i love the look and during the daytime someone's here at like three in the afternoon the anemone tank is not nearly as pretty as what they're mm. used to seeing on yeah. instagram when it's the right spectrum for the ideal picture um and i remember i gave some anemones out of that tank to someone else and in his tank they were gorgeous and I was like, that's so weird. I mean, they came from me. He goes, yeah, I know. He's like, they look like crap in your tank. And I was like, you're right. But if you get just the right spectrum, those anemones look like they're worth a billion dollars. They're so pretty. And I, I get to see them during the super blue phase, basically. But the rest of the time, no. I'm going to see if I can show you a picture of it. Okay. Oh, by the way, the dude, I'm getting a lot of people, uh, forgot to mention this, a bunch of people I think would be very willing to come and help me um, trim the tra uh, trim the uh, tank. Nice. <laughs> Can you see that? Uh, oh, it's uh, just, hang on. We gotta change. I got to turn off my background. Yeah. Hang on. Let me get out of the studio, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> You're going to leave oh, the witness protection pro uh, program there. <laughs> boring, boring. Okay, so. Oh, phone turned off. All right, so here are those anemones in, in my anemone right. tank. Oh, nice. And that's glowy. Yeah. It's pretty. And then here it is with just, you know, without enhancing the picture. They're still pretty. Yeah. I mean, they're green with pink nice. tips. And they're, they're little bubble tips. I mean, they get to be about two and a half inches, three inches across, and then they'll split. Huh. And they never get big. They never become a two-footer like a wow. rose bubble tip. That's a sweet so anemone. I, uh, yeah, it's really nice. Okay, let me put on another um, background. So what I settled on in terms of my uh, light program, uh, wow, you got awfully snowy there uh, where you are, Mark. Get the bisons <laughs> out with me. I got to feed them. <laughs> Man, you're uh, you're a real cowboy there, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I I, I basically um, do you know uh, Jim uh, Telegram? He's on uh, Instagram, YouTube. Yes. He he helped me out. He basically. What I wanted to do was mimic the spectrum of the 400 watt 20k radium bulb. So he was able to um, send me a um, a spectrum uh, a plot, I guess, that I was able to utilize 
I'm using the GHL Mitras. And uh, okay. I'm really happy with that. I mean, it, yeah, it it, uh, it kind of starts off blue early in the morning, but then kind of ramps up more to like that full spectrum look that I like in the in the afternoon, in the, uh, the early evening hours, and then it starts ramping back uh, down towards like blue again. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't do that. I think a lot of people listening tend to go into the blue, and that's their light every day. Yeah. And uh, they're not giving any white light to their tank, and I think that's a mistake because white grows corals. And oh my god, the debates that happen online about this stuff. I saw someone say. Specifically, BRS said white light is for you to make you happy, and blue light grows corals. And my head almost exploded. I mean, I was just like, "What really? did they say?" <laughs> and I didn't hear it. I didn't verify it. I just heard that. And it was third party, and I'm like, "Oh my god, so wrong." So anyway, um, white light is definitely beneficial and grows corals. We used to grow corals under 6,500 yeah. Kelvin, if you oh, remember. Yeah. Idiots, yellow yeah. bulbs, and your corals grew yeah. like this. Then you'd switch on the 20 case so you could look at them. <laughs> Because they had to then start coloring up. But no, 10K is very good for growth. Uh, white light is good. The 10K is good because it's white with a hint of blue. Yes, I love that look. Yeah, and that's why I ran for a long time. I had one called Reef Lux. I love those bulbs. I was yeah, I do remember those. 10 at a time. So I'd never run out, you know. And then I switched to Reef Bright with the Twin Arcs where I could switch. And I never looked back. I love those. And they still exist. And to be honest... I mean, I'm very happy with the sky, but if they blew up, if they died, I'd probably go back to the, my my old pendants that I still own. I'm still in the back room. I don't throw anything away like you. I save yeah. it, and I have bulbs, and I have ballast. Yeah. So, I mean, I could really go back to what I have, and I'm sure my corals would grow again like they always have. I still you know? have uh, magnetic ballast that um, yeah. will actually, they work, but then after about a week, they don't work. But uh, I still have them. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, something week? like that. Something crazy like that. They'll... Need some fresh capacity. Yeah, I think or I think so, but I still have them, you know. I wow. uh, and I still got the the old Luminarch uh, reflectors that um, yeah. are barely hanging on. Yeah, I have the Lumen Brights, and they still are in excellent yeah. shape. Remember Luminarch yeah. and Lumen Brights was a huge yeah. debate. Whose is yeah. better? And I went with the Lumen Bright because you could raise them higher off the water. You could be sixteen inches to the yeah. water, and and they had a glass shield, so your bulbs never got wet and your reflector never got spotted. And I loved them for that, and I ran them for. Ooh, 12 years well, 13 yeah years? no i mean listen you can't argue with the success you know in, yeah. in terms of the way that stuff grow corals um yeah. luis has an interesting question actually i don't i don't remember heard of this uh product uh, but one, wants to ask you uh mark to talk about live rock enhance what's live rock enhance mm -hmm. it's a product that came that comes from reef bright uh, oh really Julio. okay and you add it to your tank and the way it works you mix it up with water and you pour it in the tank and turn off your skimmer for like 30 minutes or so or an hour. And the tank will get a little cloudy for a couple of hours and then it'll just dissipate. And what you do is you added a uh, bacteria that consumes waste and it will literally clean your rock. So if you put it in your tank, according to the jar, you put it in your tank three times the first week and then twice a week for the next you know, four weeks. And after a month, you'll see a difference. And I did it in my frag system, and I was amazed. <laughs> and I was like, wow, if they worked that good, I'm putting it in the reef now. And so I was doing my reef as well. I didn't have any coral losses. There was nothing terrifying or scary about it. And if you don't pre-mix it, if you just dump it in the tank like dust, it, it'll be on the surface, and then it'll rain down all these little tiny like beads oh. in the water, real tiny ones. And the fish are gobbling them up like food, which is mm. hilarious, but it doesn't hurt them. And uh, it just works. But it was funny because the first time, and I talked about this in my live stream last weekend, Tulio called me up and goes, hey, have you tried it? I'm like, no, I'm going to. And he's like, okay, no problem. And then like a couple weeks later, he calls me. So what do you think? I was like, oh, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> and then he's like, all right. And so then like another time he calls me and he's like, Mark, did you, did you put it in the tank yet? I'm like, no. He goes, just do it. <laughs> just I'm do like, it already. Oh, I got to I gotta do such. And he goes, no, right now. Just go over and put it in right now. And I'm like, okay, okay. And so I said, well, let me turn off the skimmer. He goes, don't turn off anything. Just put it in the tank. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't even open the jar. I got to cut the label. And he goes, put it in right now. And I was like, well, how much do I need? And, and you know, it, I'm reading the instructions. And it says I need 16 scoops. He goes, just put it in right now. <laughs> so I'm like scooping into the tank while I'm on the phone on my ear, you know, talking to Tulio. And he's like, okay. And then, you know, I said, it's in the tank. Now what? And he's like, oh, you're not filming or taking pictures today, are you? I'm like, no. He's like, okay, good, because I should have told you your tank will get a little cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it works really, really well. I have a theory that I asked some people to try it. And some people, it was mixed results. 
and I think it's because everyone's tank's a little bit different. But I had this theory: if live rock and hands can, you know, clean your rock and it eats decay, could it eat away cyanobacteria? Could it eat away dinoflagellates? Mm. So I pointed that to people. Said, "Hey, you know, I sell this product. <clears throat> it's twenty bucks for a jar. If some of you, and I was telling my audience, and like, if you, some of you are willing to try this out, if you have dinos or if you have cyano, please try it. I want to know mm. if it works." Because I think it will. I think this makes sense. And I had cyano in my frag tank, and I did use it in there, and it went away. And I thought, well, maybe I didn't have very much yeah. cyano. So, you know, everything's a little different. But anyway, a lot of people came back saying it made a difference. It, in terms and of like... Is, you know, he wants you to buy the jar for the rest of your life. You know, he wants you to use it right. forever. But I use it when I need it, and then I stop. And then if I see the need, like right now because of that red turf, I'm in the mood to start dosing it. I'd like to maybe have that all eat off because you end up having really pretty rock. I mean, the rock will look clean, and then you'll see coralline just like growing. It's really interesting. This, this sounds similar to um, Brightwell has a product called Razor, right? And, and yeah, it, it could be like that, but that's all liquid. Yeah, right? and it's a polymer, I believe, that um, that uh, helps to kind of like get the gunk out of the live rock. That's um, yeah. and I, I use that uh, on one of my uh, tanks, and yeah, it, it definitely seemed to uh, work pretty well. How often do you have to use it? I've only used it once. So one one and done. Um, I think it, not something. I think basically you you should um, use it uh, as often as needed in terms of until mm -hmm. the problem is solved. But um, yeah, yeah. I um, it, you know it, it's not the the razor wasn't a chemical. It's not a chemical. So that um, <laughs> that made me a little uh, you know uh, less. Uh, You're all nervous. I know, like man. I am. I'm just. Uh, I just feel like uh, I I don't know enough about what magnesium is a chemical <laughs> right <laughs> strontium is <a> chemical <laughs> phytoplankton is made up of chemicals <laughs> i know i, mean, it I know is. It, it, there's nothing natural i mean even throwing in a banana is not <laughs> is not without hey, if the uh, if the fish eat the banana then why not <laughs> yeah no i mean i feed spock banana she likes it um all right what um Let's let's see here. We got uh, we got a, a bunch of people um, commenting in the chat here, and I'm doing my best to try to keep up with the um, razor as a chemical. I don't think so, Reef Keeper. That's um, that's not my understanding. I think um, when I was talking to Jack Ken about that, he uh, specifically said it was not a chemical. I think it's a polymer that uh, doesn't work like a uh, like a chemical. So it's Windex. Something like that. <laughs> it's a magic. It's a I magic potion. Reef the uh, Seafier ever uh, says. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Adam Moore says it. It's a polymer. Um, Mark Lemon said, "I'm gonna give it a shot." Um, Tulio is getting a call, still battling um, some dinos and cyano. Maybe it was Tulio who asked that question, Mark. Maybe it was Tulio who was like, uh, "Can you uh, ask Mark to talk about uh, live rock and hands?" <laughs> Maybe I think he came in under someone <laughs> yeah, else's he's, name. He's, uh, that, that's his alias for the for the evening. That's funny. Um, I had a question for you. You've got, so your 400 is a peninsula tank, technically, right? Pretty much, yep. Um, mm -hmm. Flow-wise, what uh, did, did you find that to be a real big challenge in terms of getting flow throughout the entire tank? Because it was you a know, problem for me. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I did have a little bit of a problem when I first set it up. I have my two returns going this way, and I have two vortex going this way. And I felt like that would work out because you got this up yeah. high, you got this down low, and you just do this, is what I was right. thinking. But then... The tank is seven feet long, and I'm looking at the hammer corals, and they're just sitting yeah. there, not wiggling. Right. And I thought, huh. So I put an MP40 in the back of the tank within probably the first month of setting up the tank to blow forward to keep the hammers doing a little bit of movement in the Duncans and the frog spawn and the yep. Acans. And that's worked out perfectly. So it's three vortex on the tank and the two returns. And I ended up changing my returns from regular conductor eductors to the ones from VCA, the random flow generators that he 3D prints. And those things are amazing. Have you ever tried any of those in your tanks? No, I have not. I've heard good things about them. Okay, so it looks like a nozzle. Yeah, I and know. It looks like a conductor. But if you put your hand in front, you'll feel the water hit here, and then it hits here, and then it hits here. That's pretty it's cool. Like, it's the weirdest thing. I'm like, and it's completely just, it's random. You know, when they say random, it's not even following, like, the points of the wheel it's just, it decides to change directions. And it's very interesting to give you a little bit of chaotic flow in the tank. And it costs you nothing because it's just part of your return. Yeah, pump. no, that's pretty cool. I, um, you know, when, when I started out, you know, so my tank is six foot long by three foot wide by 20 inches tall. 
And mm-hmm. I, I really did not want to have anything down at the end viewing panel of that tank. I wanted right. it clean. So yeah. I started out with uh, four MP40s at the, at the mm-hmm. back end panel. And mm-hmm. uh, like you kind of said, you know, my corals at the other end of the tank were just like not moving at all. I was like, all right, yeah. I'm going to step it up. I'm going to get uh, two MP60s to replace two of those uh, MP40s. 40s. And even mm-hmm. that was like not kind of... Yeah, you're pushing a long pushing way. Pushing a long way. And, and so eventually I just kind of broke down and I put two... I, so I kept the two MP60s and the, and the other two MP40s down on the one end, but I also added two more MP40s at the other end, and that just has helped solve the issue. It's unfortunate to put them there. I mean, what, what we really want, we want a pump that you can put where you yeah. need it that is 100% see-through. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, you need to clean. And we don't want any kind of arm to hold it on. We don't want a magnet. We literally just want to place it in there, and it should hover and create flow, and we'll take it out once a week or once every two weeks and clean it so it's invisible again and drop it back into that spot. We want invisible flow. That's what we want. Right. You know, and, and um, you know, I'm just not a believer in drilling holes in the bottom of a tank to, um, to have a um, closed loop type of thing going on. It scares the crap out of me. You me know? too. When I built this tank or built, when I had this one built, they said, are you going to want any holes? I'm like, no holes. No <laughs> holes anywhere. I don't want anything with a hole. And there's like, well, okay. And I was like, so how are you going to get the water out of the tank? I said, so my tank is seven feet by three feet by 30. And I said, I want the end wall to be lower than the rest of the tank. And I want an external overflow box yep. on the end. And then I want inside the tank a sheet of black acrylic with teeth on the top to hide the yep. end wall so I don't see the yep. overflow box because I don't want to look through and see that hideousness with all yep. the plumbing. So the first time they built the tank, they after 13 months, it leaked. And it literally pushed itself apart. And they just basically attributed the damage to the tank was the acrylic panel absorbed water and pushed apart slightly. Mm. It expanded mm. a little bit. And it was just enough to shove the, the silicone apart. And so when they built the new tank that they replaced it with, they made the acrylic, I don't know, like an inch less wide than the end of the tank. And they put giant beads of black silicone down the side. So it would have lots yeah. of room to expand, but it had nowhere to go. And now the tank, like I said, it's eight, eight plus years old. No leaks, no problems yet. Yeah. So, but yeah, no holes in the bottom because if, do you remember this? You used to remember Central, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Do you remember Travis, the naked reefer? That sounds, uh, that kind of rings a bell. Travis, the naked yeah. reefer. <laughs> okay. So Travis had this beautiful reef tank. It was probably a 400 or, or 500 or something huge. And he had bulkheads in the bottom and he did the closed loop and he used the Ocean's Motions yeah. device that was send the water to different holes in the bottom of the tank, right? And something, I think, was leaking, and he had to go under there. So he took off all his clothes, and he put on goggles, (laughs) and he got under there, and he wants to, and the tank's full of water, and he wanted to take the bulkhead, I think he wanted to, like, loosen it and push it up and then retighten it, or he wanted, he wanted to do something with his bulkhead, under 500 oh, gallons man. of water. I was really? like, you're Nuts. insane. So he wrote this huge story, on, and I'm reading it. I'm just like sipping my Coke slowly as I'm reading <laughs> what's happening. And he explains that when he loosened it and he pushed up, because I think what the problem was the ocean motion uh, motor was just a little too low to put his protein skimmer in place. And he had to go up like half an inch. So he thought if he could make this adjustment, he'd make everything fit. So he gets completely naked, <laughs> crawls under the tank, Puts on the goggles. Did he have to be completely it, naked? Spring every direction, right? It's going. It's <laughs> raining all over him, right? But he's naked, so it doesn't matter. But the water shoots into the electrical, and it starts sending sparks out at him. So he's got all those electrical sparks <laughs> happening. He's got water shooting everywhere. He can't see through the goggles. He's soaking wet, and he <laughs> and he tightened it up, and he fixed the problem. But oh my God! So after that happened, he has Travis a naked reefer ever <laughs> since because of that one thing he did. He just said, "Why wear clothes? I'm about to get really wet." <laughs> You're insane. Has he heard of a bathing spot. suit? You know, perhaps. Uh... <laughs> no, he's naked. He actually said it, not me. So I'm assuming bone naked with goggles. <laughs> Back then, we didn't have cell phones to take pictures of this. Yeah, that would have like uh, made the rounds on social that media. That would have yeah. gone viral for sure. Um, yeah, I don't. So, um, okay, what else we got going on here? We got more comments about Razor and whatnot, and we got a little back and forth thing happening about uh, Razor oh, oh and chemicals. But um, so, um, 
All right, Mark. I think um, I don't know if we uh, we should wrap it uh, now. Maybe uh, maybe just leave it for you to kind of um, give your final thoughts. I mean, there's so many things to talk about, and and I'd keep love, going. I'd love to have you on a uh, on again, but uh, yeah, Aww. folks, if uh, if Mark is willing, ask away. You know, let uh, drop some questions in the chat. I still have uh, a ton more uh, questions myself for um, for Mark, but. Um, uh, okay, I see. Uh, so, this is an interesting topic that uh, we talked about on one of our live streams, and and uh, Chris from ACI is is uh, was was a guest on on the show a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and and um, I also had both um, Paletta on and Sanjay. We we're, were talking all about this, and and each Chris and and um, Mike were kind of like an alignment in terms of questioning whether or not the uh, you the lack of uv in leds is potentially problematic for corals mm -hmm. can that impact the uh, the health of corals because for both tulio tulio came to both uh, mike's house and also to chris's facility with the mm -hmm. spectrometer and determined that there was no uv mm -hmm. coming out of their led fixtures and thus that could be a uh, an issue for coral health yet um Sanjay was more skeptical, as Sanjay mm -hmm. tends to be, and mm -hmm. and thought, uh, you know, you got to prove it to me. You got to show me the data. We're actually that yeah. that's um, that's that's the case. Have have you ever, um, you know, or, or I don't know if I how to how to ask you this question, but do you, do you believe in that uh, potential theory that the lack of UV and LEDs, if that is the case, can impact coral health? That corals need certain things from UV light. Well, we definitely know the corals use everything. In nature, they're getting the full gamut from the sun, and it's all the bandwidth, right? <laughs> and the lighting we get from metal halides or from LEDs or T5s, they're always going to be a part of all of the thing. We can't have it all. And I do remember it was probably eight years ago, I was at one of the Macnas, and Orphic was introducing a new light. And their salesman would, he had these orange pots like terracotta pots in the bottom of the tank. Yep. And he would say, watch this. And he would adjust something on his phone or on their controller or whatever it was he held. And the orange pot would turn orange and then you adjust it. It kind of went gray. It went kind of invisible. And I was like, what are you doing? And he says, I'm adjusting the UV. I was like, okay. Mm. And he said, so think about this. If you have an orange clownfish, do you want it to look orange? And I'm like, well, yes. And he says, well, then you would just adjust this so they look orange. And that way your clownfish look the right color. <laughs> And I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> really? Like, what are you talking about? And I was like, okay, that's weird. I can tell you this. One of the things that you and I both know from running metal halides, that the bulb is encased in a glass outer tube yeah. to stop the UV radiation. Yeah. And when one of those glass tubes breaks and cracks open, which has happened to me in the past, where I have half a test tube and a gap, I had a streak of white death in my reef right through the corals in a, in a path that matched the gap in the bulb because the UV was not being filtered. So if we were so worried about keeping the UV out of our tank back then, do we want UV coming in through LEDs? I don't know. That's, that's a thing for somebody that sells lighting to answer. I don't know the answer to yeah. that one. Yeah. But I do know that, you know, one of the reasons we love sunlight so much and aquaculture facilities like to use natural light as much as they can is the, it's the whole spectrum. They're not just getting a piece of it. Right. So Tulio just did a recent study over at um, the uh, Biosphere 2 in Arizona. And he measured the lighting and he measured a thousand watt metal halide over their, their little ocean they have. They have an ocean inside their biosphere. And then he did a different kind of bulb and a different thing. And he showed the different spectrums and he showed how stuff was missing. And so, yeah, there is a chance that some of the things our tanks may need is not being included, which is probably one of the reasons why we've so often tried to make hybrid lighting and supplemental lighting to kind of make up for the lack of something. LEDs have definitely gotten better from where they were a decade ago. You know, the original lights that we saw, they were dim. And then they start making stuff a little bit more powerful, but they were still... Um, their, their light was so directional that you had a lot of shadowing. 
Right. And so they started, you know, look at the radion, look at the uh, the sky. They're making these huge panels with a lot of lights. When Orphic came out with their light, it was like this long and this wide, and it had like 500 little circles. And you're like, that's a lot of lights. Yeah. One metal halide, you know? Yeah. And I was thinking it's kind of like a disco floor, you know, upside down <laughs> above the tank. But, you know, I don't see that with the sky. It definitely blends perfectly. You don't see certain colors and other colors no matter what uh, spectrum I set it on, everything looks even. So I'm very happy you, with that. Do you think, I don't know if you've ever run like a T5 only tank, but do you think it's uh, it's sort of like a uh, replicates T5s? I mean, that's my impression in terms of these new LED panel lights is that uh, they're very T5 like. You know, I could see that. I actually never ran an all T5 light. I only tried out T5s briefly when they first hit the market. And I was already running metal halides, and so I used some T5s next to the metal halides for the supplemental actinics. And I didn't, I liked the idea that it used less power than a VHO, but it wasn't impressive. It was just like, okay, and it seemed kind of expensive, and I'd have to replace them regularly. And then there was all this debate about which T5 bulb should you buy. And I remembered I'd go to people's homes with my PAR meter, and I'd measure their lighting. And it was really weird. Have you ever measured PAR in a T5 tank? No. So this is crazy then. If you ever get one, you'll have to see this for yourself. But if you put your meter inside your metal halide tank, you'll see the numbers jump around. You put the meter inside an LED tank and the numbers jump around on the meter. And then you put the, the meter inside a T5 tank and just, that's it. <laughs> it's one number. <laughs> it's the same. There's no difference. Like, that's insane. <laughs> and there's no change. I mean, obviously you go deeper, yes. But it, there was none of that fluctuation that we're so used to seeing you know, that PAR meters do. And T5 is like a whole other beast. And I never really liked the look of T5. It reminded me of pastel. pastel There's no shimmer. You know, I mean, that's, that's you know, what I loved about the uh, having metal halides is kind of like yeah. that, uh, that shimmer effect. All right. Yeah. So we got, we got a, we got a bunch of questions now uh, pouring in for you there, uh, Mark. Okay. Um, a couple of quick ones uh, on Orthodox Reef. Mark, favorite acrylic bit and solvent? Okay. The favorite bit uh is um i think it's osram is the brand i get it from amazon because they sell them in bulk and it's an up curl bit it's on my cnc machine so it, it's not like you know, i mean if you're going to use something in a handheld router freud makes great blades there are some that are green colored from a woodworking company that i've tried out they were okay um but, and then, you know, just whatever round over bit you can find so the edges aren't sharp is really important. That's one of the things I didn't want to do. And then the solvent, I always tell people to get weld on because you can get it anywhere. Mm -hmm. But myself, I don't use weld on anymore. I use something else. Gotcha. You want to keep that <laughs> in the down low? <laughs> I actually poured from its magic bottle with its label into little brown bottles, so I never know the name. Ah, uh, it's just, gotcha. I have to order a case a year and I transfer it to little tiny bottles I can hold because I'm filling them into really small bottles. A little bit at a time, yeah. you know, and yeah, yeah. so I see the label only when I have to refill the bottles. Gotcha. Uh, Michael Sierra is asking, hey, Mark, you're still using Prodidio? Prodidio? Yes, I think was the answer I to that question. Today. Yes. <laughs> um, Reef Girl is asking, please ask Mark how he manages humidity. I have a dehumidifier in this room and I turn it on at night. And like this time of year, our weather here in Texas is a little bit nutty right now. I mean, today was 75. Next it, just a few days I don't know, ago, Mark, it, it kind of looks like it's like 20 degrees and snowing by um, Texas right now. But I was right going to say, a couple of days ago, it was 21, and the bison were in my backyard. But uh, <laughs> no, uh, the, the weather was 75, so I was out there working on my building today, you know, putting up the studs because I'm trying to get it ready for electrical and, and sheet rockers. But um, the, the weather changes. We have a lot of humidity in Texas. I have a huge reef tank that adds humidity to the house. Yeah. And so I have vents on the ceiling for the air conditioner system that rust. And I have mm. the intake on the floor that goes into the AC rusts and other things go bad. And the front of my refrigerator, the stainless steel, stainless steel, right? Really? That's rusting? It was rusting when I contacted them to say, uh, warranty, like <laughs> stainless steel isn't covered. Really? I was like, and I looked at the, and it, was, it literally was on the, on the, the warranty does not cover the stainless steel. <laughs> the most important part. Hold of on. Your, I thought stainless steel is never supposed to rust. <laughs> so. I, uh, I remember last year, Caitlin took a barkeeper's helper and just scrubbed the front down and got it beautiful again. She spent hours on it. Wow. And she got it super nice and clean. And then I've been putting lemon oil on it ever since. 
which you is very hard to come by. I mean, I guess you can get on Amazon, but you can't go to any store and get lemon oil, which is the biggest seller to every restaurant across the nation. They put it on all their countertops. They you know, everywhere huh. that's stainless steel, you put lemon oil. It's fast food, uh, lubies, you know, the the cafeterias, everywhere that has a restaurant, they use lemon oil. But you can't buy it for, for the regular person. So I actually had a friend who runs a bar said, Can you please pick me up some lemon oil? And she gave me some in an aerosol can where I can actually spray it on the fridge and then wipe it down. And I do oh, it every wow. single month, protect it. But I run a dehumidifier to answer your question. I run it at night while I'm asleep because it's noisy and it adds heat to the air. And so I, I joke in the winter, I turn it on, it goes, time for some free heat because I'm paying for the dehumidifier. <laughs> yeah, right. But, you know, it's a byproduct of taking moisture out of the air. In the summer, it, it, it takes, it fills up twice a day. Oh, turns wow. Itself off. Jeez. And then in the winter, it could go three weeks before I have to empty it. It's the weirdest thing. Do you have um, issues with uh, keeping your pH elevated at a, uh, you know, at a decent level? You know, in terms of uh, obviously you're probably not uh, keeping windows shut that too often. You know. No, I do. I hate outside air. Do you? <laughs> I am the worst. <laughs> I've gotten better because of my dog. I have to let her in and out a lot. So as soon as I open the door, she takes forever. And I'm like, come on, you're letting in the fresh air. Stop it. <laughs> and uh, But my tank tends to run according to my probe, 8.1 to 8.3 every day. So I'm yeah, not really good. Yeah. sweating it. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had to put a um, an air exchange unit in the basement here because, you know, in Vermont, especially in the uh, in the wintertime, the windows yeah. and everything are just shut really, really tight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my pH went up like 0.2 pH points after that yeah. air exchange unit was uh, was installed. So that was like pretty awesome. And you have a fireplace or you have gas or any of that uh, stuff? We, we have no? a, uh, yeah, we have a, a, a fireplace, but that's upstairs. Mm -hmm. So um, not, not downstairs. But well, the reason I ask is my house is all electric. So I don't have anything given off CO2 except for me and my dog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're the ones breathing, you know, that's it. Right. So I haven't really had a problem. Even when I had the party here and everyone's walking in and out, I didn't see the pH depressed like it can in a fish store. Right. You know, where they'll have a big event and all their tanks are like super low pH and they're telling everyone to get out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're screwing things up. Um, Bert Minshew is asking, Chris, everybody loves, oh, okay, that's, that's, he's talking about somebody else. He's talking about Chris from ACI. Uh, this is the comment I wanted to, um, um, Queen City Reefs and more. And, um, the statement starts off in lower caps, but then it becomes all caps. Oh, so. they're yelling at us. All right, keep going. <laughs> I don't know if it's yelling. Well, let's see. Mark, how are you feeling about your reef tank today? And now it starts in the caps. Are you feeling like it will turn out to look better than ever before? Or do you feel that you will miss the way it used to be? You know, um, I, I love the way it is. I mean, it's doing really well. It's growing. It's just, it's kind of half empty still because all the frags I put in need to grow. And technically I should be further along because when we were done with the reset in June, we had nice fist-sized colonies in there that would be seven months later. They'd be big now. Yeah. In about nine months, they'd be fantastic. And instead, the lack of potassium wiped out a lot of those. <laughs> and so I'm kind of, I had to start over with new corals that I got from several sources. I got some from Ryan's Thousand Gallon Reef. I got some from Chris Meckley, um, who you mentioned. I got some sent to me from Seachem. Uh, that was through Chris. I had some come from uh, Terra Reef. Um, I picked up some at Aquashella. There's actually a lot of corals in my tank right now. Too many. Even Dwayne's like, you have way too many acros out there. That's not going to work out long term. You know this. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know. I know. But I'll just kind of rearrange and move things a little bit and kind of keep the peace. But there's a lot of nice vivid colors in there. I just did a reef diary um, a week ago where I showed a close up. It's like one minute long, a minute and a half. And you can actually see the reef if you want. It looks really nice. It's doing really well. I'm just sick of cleaning the glass. I cannot believe how much I have to clean the glass these days. Yeah, you're, it's every day. You were talking about that before the live stream that you're getting a lot of um, green. green uh, yeah. Any every any day. any theories in terms of why that might uh, be happening? Stupid skies. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. It's weird. It's been going like this for months. It's like every day. If I miss a day, it's like, oh my god, I can't see through the tank, which is mm. insane. But as soon as I wipe it off, and you and you do this with a magnet, it goes. Poof, it yeah. looks like phytoplankton. It's right. like it's not bad. It's just irritating. Right. It, yeah, it's just because you want ass. nice, clean glass to look yeah. at your, your stuff, and it's like, why are you doing this? <laughs> um, just one, whatever. Of, one of it, those things. I could have worse problems, right, than having just erase the glass. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I I clean my glass like every other day, and uh, and I've been I don't know for some reason that's always the way it's been with my tanks. It's 
every other day. It's not like three or four days and I clean the glass. It's always been every other day. But Well, uh, the anemone cube, I clean it once a week. I don't oh, know really? what the difference. And they're all the same system too. It's all the same water. But the anemone cube, I don't know. It, it's been running a long time. It's a very simple tank. It just flow and light, right? And, and thousands of tentacles. And I will go in there once a week with a razor blade on a mag float and I will chisel the glass down. And then the next day I'm like, oh, that tank is so pretty. It just looks so good. <laughs> But, you know, then it starts to get a little bit of algae, but doesn't get the green stuff. And, I mean, I joked about the sky, but technically the 400 is a sky. The 60 gallon has a radion and the radion's not growing this green sheen. <laughs> so I don't know. Just saying. Maybe the sky has the perfect amount of UV <laughs> to grow. <laughs> I got to get Tulio out there with a spectrometer. <laughs> I think he needs to show up here and he'll probably make me put in some live rock enhance too. Uh, there you go. He'll, uh, he'll, he'll insist. Yeah. Um, do it now. Just do it. All right. One last topic I wanted to, uh, to talk to you about is um, quarantine and corals. Do you, okay. do you have a, um, do you have a process? Do you have a quarantine tank? And um, I did in the past and I'm going to have another one soon. Uh, I've been complaining about my frag tank for a long time. It's the, the glass is, or the acrylic is ruined on the inside to where it never looks clear. Mm. Even when it's scrubbed, it, it looks like orange peel. It's messed up. Calcium mm. did something to it. And I thought about drain the tank and polish it and make a video about polishing acrylic. Mm. And I'm like, it'd be easier to build a tank. Than <laughs> it's to a big job. Polish this out, right? I'm like, do I really want to do this? But that's a video, you know. <laughs> so it's content. It's like maybe I'll replace the tank and I'll still do the video with the tank out of the house and no livestock at risk. But my thought was replace that tank, which is 60 gallon, to maybe something that's more like 40 gallons, and then the extra space could be a little quarantine. That's about 15, 20 gallons. And I liked having a quarantine tank running nonstop all the time. And it had its own live rock that never left that tank. It never would be used in my reef because it, any kind of medications or anything I ever got on it, it's in there. Any kind right. of pests, it's in there. Yep. And I would come home with new frags and I would float them in there. I'd release them in there. And then if I wanted to ignore them for a whole week, I could. And then I would dip them or I could observe them every single day and see if they had anything weird crawling off of them. So that was how I did it. Uh, fish quarantine... <clears throat> I didn't have much luck with it in the past. And there's some hobbyists who I respected who they just said, I never quarantine fish. It never works. I put them in there. They go to die. I put in my reef. They live. He's like, <laughs> I just don't do it. And then blue life USA came out with safety stop probably in 2009 or 2010. And it was this rapid fish bath. It takes 45 minutes for part a and then 45 minutes for part B. And you put your brand new fish that you just came home with. You acclimate, you put it in part a for 45 minutes, you move it to part B and any external parasites are gone. Oh. And I was like, done. This mm. is fantastic. Everyone's going to, you guys are going to be rich yeah. <laughs> because this stuff's incredible because I know no one keeps a quarantine tank. They say they do, but they don't. Yeah. So, <laughs> most don't. And uh, I've been using it ever since for the last decade. I only do all my fish through safety stop. And my fish mm. are not 100% perfect, but I don't have issues with velvet, ick, uh, you know, the other stuff, the cauliflower, uh, thing that clownfish get the clownfish disease yeah i don't really run into those things occasionally something like this the fish will scratch their eye on something and get popeye or, or get some damage yeah but that's just living on a reef and i you know whatever but for corals i don't like ordering oh i'll definitely not quarantine uh cleanup crew which some people talk about i bring the yeah i've never crew done in, that I yeah it, I put it in the reef and i let it go yeah and i don't dip it you don't dip your quarantine. <laughs> no, you're, you you're, don't you're dip your cleanup crew. Yeah, cleanup crew because you'll kill your cleanup crew. No, you just uh, put your stuff in. But it is nice if if you're in a situation where you suddenly get corals you're not prepared to receive, like a gift or someone shows up at your door with a, uh, a small coral. If you have nowhere to put it, that means you have to stop what you're doing to deal with the coral and get it in your tank. Yeah. But if I have a quarantine running that's just the right temperature, right flow, right mm -hmm. light on the schedule. And I can just put it in and I can dose two part if I need to for a few days or do a couple of small water changes so the, or even drain the water out and suck water out of the reef into the quarantine tank, you know, so they get the same water. That's, um, really easy. that's what I'm doing. I have a, um, I got a 20 gallon quarantine tank and, um, I've got a few pieces of live rock in there. Um, yep. I've got a uh, little led over it. I don't have a protein skimmer. I've got a hang on the back filter. I've got a, yeah. a heater and a little uh, Jabra in there that um, circulates water. And every week mm -hmm. when I do water change on my um, you know, my bigger uh, systems, 
I drain yeah. about 80% of the water out of that quarantine tank and I put, I fill it up with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the mature established tank water and yeah, the used reef water. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it seems like 10 minutes a week in terms of that yeah. maintenance. It's, um, it's nice to have that, uh, little backup quarantine tank and you, you know, when you get new frags or something like that, then yeah. they sit in there and, uh, you know, I dip once a week and you know, it's a process, but yeah. When Dwayne was here and he was helping me with the reset, we had to put all these corals somewhere. Yeah. And we drained that entire tank down to the bottom because it was just hideous. I just <laughs> hating that tank because I can't see through it. And we drained everything out. We took out everything. We put in a bag of brand new sand I had that had never been opened. And we drained all tank water into there. So both systems are the same salt water. Yeah. And then as we took corals out, we just put them in there. And everything was fine. And I had all these backup corals in case something bad happened to my reef. But I did my big water change my reef. I also had done a water change my frag tank, and that's what killed all my backup corals. Yes. And that's why I had two different tests. Say, double, bad double, pass, you know. double whammy. It sucked. I was like, are you kidding me? Because I was like, well, at least I've got extras of these. That's okay. And then I watched all of them die. I was like, wow. I was like, and I thought, you know, of course, I thought, oh, I didn't stay on top of my alkalinity. You know, that was my thought. You know, nope. It was 193 potassium. You know, I... Um, the reason why, a big reason why I got my Peninsula tank was because I wanted a second system as a backup yeah. to the, uh, you know, to the one system that I did have. But, you know, thinking about it, you do get a bad batch of salt and you use the same salt for all your tanks, yeah. then you are screwed. And you don't know it's bad until it happens. No. That's why we test everything. But, I mean, I didn't test, I've never tested for potassium. So that was not one of my lists. Just like I would never test for iodine. I would never test for molybdenum or however you say that. You know, <laughs> I can't even molybdenum? Say I don't even know. I feel like it's missing a vowel. <laughs> molybdenum. Yeah. Molybdenum. <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, now I'm going to have to start sending out ICP tests for every time I make a new batch of salt water. Thanks a lot there, Mark. You know, I think uh, you're, you're, well, you're costing me more money. With a brand new container. With a brand new container. Brand new container. Okay. Just have Chris test it for free. Make him do it. He'll do it. <laughs> yeah, he's got a lot of buddies down in Florida there. That uh, I think he has his own ICP yeah. at this point. I think. I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah, he's got something <laughs> cooking like that. He's got, he's got somebody in his back pocket <laughs> cooking his water. <laughs> he's grown some pretty corals no i think he uh he, he did talk about that before in the uh, in the chat so um i think i think they got a big uh something something something's definitely cooking all right dude well listen i'm gonna um uh, we're gonna wrap this up and and i'm gonna let you go and okay. um this was a lot of fun mark i really really enjoyed this and and, and i really appreciate you um spending some time with any final thoughts for the uh, folks out there that have uh, tuned in or no, I covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> What's left? We've talked about everything. Well, you know, folks, if you, if you want to like just, uh, you know, have you, if you have been following them, just keep following whatnot. Go check them out on YouTube at uh, He Loves Reef and, uh, you know, his website. He, um, he has um, a whole bunch of cool stuff. Sells acrylic products, right, Mark, on the website and sumps and overflow boxes and water reservoirs. And uh, you also I sell a lot of the products I use. I yeah. sell lighting, I sell pumps, I sell dosers, I sell uh, test kits and Prodibio. I mean, I sell a lot of stuff. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of inventory here. It's all going to move into the new building as soon as it's done. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, I do have something to say. Uh, it has nothing to do with reef keeping. Yeah. Just hug, hug your loved ones, you know, because you never know what's going to happen. And treat, other, treat each other kindly because this world is really on fire right now. And we need a little bit more peace. We need a little bit more happiness. So that's it's a, kind of uh, that's to each other. That's a, that's a great way to end the show, Mark. I appreciate that. And, um, yeah. So on that note, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sign off. And, and I just also want to, uh, you know, again, thanks Mark for, for spending time with us on the live stream. I also want to thank my uh, sponsors, Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for sponsoring the, uh, the live stream. And also for all you folks out there that have been tuning in and watching, really appreciate that. And remind everybody I do the, uh, I, I actually, grab the uh the audio from this uh mark and i do crank out podcasts it's easy for, oh, it's easier for me yeah. because yeah. it you know we're just having this conversation there's not a lot of show and tell that i do right. on these live streams so yeah we the, all the wrapping and re refund episodes are available as podcasts on spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and stitcher and see stitcher so uh yeah if you if you missed this uh, live you can check out the uh audio replays on those platforms my next live stream will be next thursday at 7 p.m eastern standard time and i got adam from battle corals coming back on so that should be another great show 
So until then, be uh, safe, and we will see you next time. Ha, ha, ha.